Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, Dr. Dodie Robinson and Dr. Sarah Kelly from the Johns Hopkins Pediatric Epilepsy Center will be speaking about children and epilepsy, everything a family needs to know. Before we get started, we like to provide some user tips so that you are comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenters. The last 30 minutes will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. Please note this program is being recorded. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your questions will be seen by others watching this presentation, so please note if you do not want your name attached to the question, please check send anonymously. Also, your email address will not be shared with any third parties. We will do our best to answer all questions we receive during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of the program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Robinson and Dr. Kelly to begin our presentation. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming today. We're very excited to be here to talk to you about epilepsy and treatment options for epilepsy. So we're going to go through a few things during this talk. We're first going to talk about seizures and epilepsy and the definitions of those words and what we think about when we talk about epilepsy. And then we're going to talk about epilepsy treatment. And we're going to talk about three main categories of treatment. These include medication, dietary therapy, and surgical options. So first, some definitions. What do we mean when we say a seizure? So a seizure is excessive or synchronous electrical activity in the brain, which can lead to physical signs or symptoms. So you may hear us discuss sparks, sharp waves, spikes, um, interictal activity. We use a lot of words for the activity that can be seen between seizures. And when that activity builds up within the brain, it can cause a seizure. And when the seizure occurs, you can see or feel physical symptoms. So you may see jerking of your arm, you may have full body shaking, or you may just have a feeling such as a rising sensation in your stomach or feeling lightheaded. When we talk about epilepsy, we're talking about multiple unprovoked seizures. So that means seizures that weren't caused by a high fever or meningitis, weren't caused by a, a head injury or a concussion. And so when you have more than one unprovoked seizure, that's the definition of epilepsy. Additionally, someone can have one seizure with something else that makes it more likely that they're going to have more seizures, and that can be abnormalities on the EEG. And in that case, there is also the diagnosis of epilepsy that is given. Epilepsy is really common and seizures are really common. One in 10 people will have a seizure at some point in their life and one in 26 people will have epilepsy at some point in their life. So it's very likely that you know many people who have epilepsy, even though it doesn't affect their day-to-day -day life and you may not realize. Febrile seizures are even more common and 5% of children will have febrile seizures at some point in their life. And with these numbers, we know that up to 40,000 children will have a new onset of seizures uh, each year. When we think about seizures, we put them in two main categories. So we first think about generalized seizures or focal seizures. Generalized seizures involve the whole brain and therefore often the whole body and typically have loss of awareness or loss of consciousness with them. Focal seizures just start in one part of the brain and we, we divide focal seizures into two different parts. We can think about focal aware seizures and that means that the person is completely aware of what is going on. So for example, as I mentioned, you could have a seizure where you have just right jerking of your, or jerking of your right arm, and the person is completely awake, knows their arm is jerking, can tell you it won't stop, but that could be a seizure with, um, with awareness. A focal unaware seizure is when there is a change in awareness. So what that means is you could be completely out, you could have passed out and not be um, alert at all, or you could just be somewhat confused. Some of the prior terms that you may have heard for these types of seizures, generalized seizures used to be called grand mal seizures, focal seizures used to be called complex partial seizures, but they have some newer names and that's what I'm presenting here today. So how do we diagnose a seizure? The main thing that we look at is the clinical history. So what that is, is the description of the event. So what happened? What did the seizure look like? Did it involve just one part of the body? How long was it? Was there anything else that the person was doing? Did they have lip smacking? Were they picking at their clothes? 
Uh, did they have any movements of their eyes? These are all questions we ask to try to figure out what the type of seizure was and how best to treat it. And then we also look at the EEG. So that is when we put all the electrodes or stickers on the head, which record brain waves and look for the electrical activity in the brain. And in the corner there, I have an example for you of uh, an EEG where you see normal brain waves and you see a burst of seizure activity and then again, normal brain waves. So once we've diagnosed epilepsy, then we think about the options for treatment of seizures. When we think about treatment options, we divide them into three main categories. These include medication, which are anti-seizure medicines, and dietary therapy. These can be the ketogenic diet, modified Atkins diet, and there's others as well, but the two that I'm gonna focus on today are the, that are most commonly used are those two. The other thing we consider is whether surgery is an option. And this can be resective sur surgery, thermal ablation, or devices such as the vagus nerve stimulator and the responsive neurostimulation. So when do we treat seizures? So in general, everyone's allowed to have one seizure. And I say that because I mentioned earlier that one in 10 people will have a seizure at some point in their life. And once you have one seizure, you have about a 50-50 chance, maybe a little bit less, of having a second seizure. So that doesn't mean you necessarily need to treat it. And especially in children who are driving, um, we often do not treat the first seizure. There are a couple times when we will treat the first seizure. And those include when there is something else that gives us a good indication that there's a high likelihood of having another seizure. That could be activity on the EEG. Or if having a second seizure could really be problematic for the person. Um, this is most common in adults when they, for example, have a job where they need to be able to drive. And then in that case, we might treat um, after our first seizure. But we know that after a second seizure, the risk of having a third seizure is even higher, 70 to 80%. And so that's usually when we recommend treatment. First, we're gonna talk about the medications, or the anti-seizure medicines that are available for the treatment of epilepsy. We have lots of seizure medicine options, over 30 options at this point. And I'm not gonna be able to go through them all, but I'm happy to answer questions about some of them uh, later. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few in a few categories that we have and just give you an idea um, of what we use to treat. So there's the older medicines. So medicines that have been around for many, many years um, and are still used um, today and work very effectively. These include phenobarbital, which is mostly just used in neonates or infants at this point, valproic acid, and ethosuximide. Ethosuximide is an example of a medicine that's used for a specific seizure syndrome, in this case, absence epilepsy. And then we have newer medicines. So we have levetiracetam, which is the one that most people have probably heard of. The trade name is Keppra. We have oxcarbazepine, also called trileptal, and lamotrigine, also called lamictal, which are common medicines that are used to treat epilepsy as well. And we have some of the newer medicines. These include clobazam, called Anfi in this country. Clobazam is there is relatively new in the US, but has been used for years and years in Europe. And so we do have a lot of experience with it and has been helpful. Cannabidiol or CBD is one of the newer medications to come to market as Epidiolex. And the Epidiolex is the pharmaceutical grade uh, CBD. There are other ways to get CBD as well. And what CBD has been studied for so far are very severe epilepsy syndromes, such as Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, Dravet syndrome, and most recently tuberous sclerosis. And we do find that it helps some folks, uh, some people and some patients who have these seizures. And it is likely to help patients who have other seizures as well. But it is important to know about CBD that it is another medicine. It does have side effects like other medicines. It's not a natural supplement. It does affect the liver and liver function tests need to be followed. It can uh, affect the doses of other medicines in the system and it can make you sleepy. Another medicine that um, is very new to the market is called Sonobamate and has been shown to be very effective in people whose other medicines haven't been helpful. However, right now it's only available for adults. Hopefully that'll change soon. And then one of the newest medicines to come to the market is fenfluramine, which is being used for children with Dravet syndrome, a very serious seizure disorder. So how do we choose? We have all these seizure medicines. How do we choose which one is the right one to use? So first we think about what type of epilepsy someone has. So I mentioned the medicine at the succamide, which is used specifically for absence epilepsy. So sometimes the type of syndrome helps us decide. Sometimes whether or not the seizure is generalized or focal helps us decide. And then we think about how the medicines work. Each of them works a little bit differently. Some of them on different channels within the brain. And so when we think about using more than one medicine together, we often think about if we can use two medicines that work differently to 
to provide a better effect. And then we think about side effect, side effect profile. So the newer medicines have fewer side effects than the older medicines. And so we kind of weigh the risks and benefits of each medicine before we prescribe it. And we also think about if the medicine is used for something else. Many of the seizure medicines are also used for other things like headache, pain, ticks. Um, and so we, we think about if someone has something else going on, can we use one medicine to treat two things at once? And then we always think about drug-drug interactions. So are the seizure medicines interacting with each other? Are they interacting with other medicines that you may be taking? This is especially um, important thinking about oral contraceptives, which I'll mention in a minute. So the goal of seizure medicine is to reduce the excitability in the brain. So you're trying to reduce the excitability that's caught, the extra excitability that's causing the seizure. Because of that, there are risks to, to all medicines, uh, to all the seizure medicines of having side effects. These can include dizziness, sleepiness, trouble thinking, attention difficulties. And we know that these side effects can be more problematic than seizures. So it's really important to talk with your doctor about side effects because our goal is to find a medicine that treats your seizures without causing you side effects. And so if one medicine is causing a problem, there's likely another one out there that won't. To check for side effects, we think about checking blood work um, for some of the medicines, but not all of them. We look at blood counts. We sometimes check liver function um, and other organ function. And we ask you about your side effects. Are you having any mood issues with your medicine? Are you having any trouble staying awake because of it? Are you having any trouble thinking? But in general, most people don't have side effects to medicine. It's just a small proportion of people will have a problem with them. But if you do have one, you definitely want to talk to your doctor about it. The other thing we think about is how medicines affect other medicines. So there are a class of medicines called inducers. What that means is that it causes other medicines to be metabolized more quickly. Oxcarbazepine or trileptal, cobazam or monfi are in this category. And this is especially important when thinking about oral contraceptives because they can reduce the efficacy of pregnancy protection with these medicines. So you definitely want to talk with your doctor about that. There are also other medicines called inhibitors. Alproic acid or Depakote is one of those. And that can slow the metabolism of other medicines and increase the level in your system. So we have a lot of medicines and they help a lot of people. However, um, not everyone is helped by medicine. About two thirds of patients will be seizure free after trying two medicines. But there's a third of people who will not be able to have their seizures controlled with medicine. And after trying two medicines, the likelihood of another one working is actually quite low, less than 5%. It doesn't mean we're not gonna find the right medicine that works for some people, but it makes it much less likely. And so when medicine's not working, that's when we start to think about the other options. And those include diet and surgery. Thinking about diet, we often think about what's called the ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet is a very high fat, low carbohydrate and adequate protein diet. And you'll often see these ratios, four to one, three to one. And what that means is the four or the three is fat and the one is everything else. So to put that in context, the average American diet is about a one to three ratio with one being fat and three being everything else. So this is a very restrictive and different diet than folks are used to eating on a day-to-day -day basis. And the idea is that it mimics fasting and therefore produces ketosis, which means the brain starts using fat for energy instead of glucose or, or sugar. And we tend to use it when someone has intractable epilepsy, so they failed more than two medicines without getting control of their seizures, or in specific seizure syndromes where it has been found to be very helpful. Another version which is less restrictive of this diet is called the modified Atkins diet. This again is a very high fat, low carbohydrate diet, but is less restrictive. It's more of a one-to-one -one ratio. You don't have to weigh and measure your food like you do with a ketogenic diet. And you can go out and order food at the restaurants um, and kind of eat a little bit more normally, but you do still need to monitor your carbohydrates um, and make sure you're keeping an eye on how much fat you're eating. And now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Dr. Robinson to discuss surgery. Good morning, and thanks again for joining us. Let's see if we can get the slides to advance. So if you could go ahead and advance them, that would be great. There we go. So um, as Dr. Kelly just discussed, approximately 100 to 200,000 patients in the United States are um, potentially refractory to ep epilepsy medications and other options and candidates for surgery. 
But unfortunately, only about two to 3,000 people in the US undergo surgery for epilepsy each year. And this means only maybe about one in a hundred or, or so are taking advantage of some options to really gain a lot more control in their life. And this is very important, we feel, for children. The ongoing seizures can be very devastating to their psychology and behavior, as well as obviously it's disruptive for their education. And it can cause a lot of social difficulties, especially as children grow into the teenage years. So the advance of slides. So one of the first things that we start with is continuous video EEG monitoring. Well, some patients undergo monitoring to better define the type of seizures they're having. When we start thinking about a surgical workup, one of the main goals is to identify if whether the seizures are coming from a single source or if there's multiple seizure onset zones. We like to have several seizures during the monitoring period. So some of our kids are monitored overnight, whereas others stay up for up to a week. And we like to have several seizures of each seizure type to better define where the seizures are coming from. Do they come from the right brain, the left brain? And then to localize which area of the brain that they are coming from. We like to be able to correlate the seizure onset zones with any imaging abnormalities that the patient may have. For example, the patient may have areas of abnormality or multiple areas of abnormality on the MRI, but the seizures are only coming from primarily one place, and that means they may be a candidate for surgery. So the video EEG on using the scalp helps us determine whether they need intracranial monitoring. The next slide, please. So there's two main forms of intracranial monitoring. That's putting the electrodes inside the skull. One of the most common now is called SEEG, or stereoelectroencephalography. And that's placing, using a carefully made roadmap that I use computer algorithms to help develop, and with the assistance of the robot to place very small electrodes within the depth of the brain. And this is illustrated, for example, here on this MRI picture. And these tiny electrodes let us sample the electrical activity from the depth of the brain, and that really helps us to better define and localize where the seizures may be coming from. Sometimes instead, we need to put strips or grids of electrodes over the surface of the brain, and this requires open surgery. And our main goal with this is to lateralize and localize where the seizures are coming from, to be able to correlate those uh, EEG findings with the imaging abnormalities, for example, if they again have multiple abnormalities. In addition, when we have the electrodes inside the skull, we're able to map the eloquent areas of the brain. So we can identify where the speech area is, we can identify where the motor or sensation areas are, and this can be very helpful when we think about treatment options. Next slide, please. So we have numerous different types of epilepsy surgeries to offer. And just like there's numerous medications that we select for various reasons, we choose the surgeries. For example, if the seizures are all coming from the right frontal area part of the brain, we can go in and remove that area. Um, another option is using laser ablation or thermal ablation. And laser ablation is done with placing a probe very carefully into the depths of the brain and then applying heat to basically remove that area of the brain. Larger surgeries include disconnections and hemispherectomy. The picture in the upper right is a child who was born with an area of the brain damaged by a stroke prior to birth, and we were able to perform a, a functional hemispherectomy, and you know, that child now is seizure free. So it can make a huge difference for these kids in terms of their quality of light. Corpus callosotomy is dividing the main uh, connecting structure between the two hemispheres and that uh, prevents the seizures from traveling from one side of the brain to the other. This is more of a palliative procedure, so it will not make someone seizure free, but it can again make a huge difference in their quality of light. As Dr. Kelly mentioned, vagus nerve stimulator and responsive neurostimulation, RNS and VNS, are two stimulation options we have. And then subpeel transections are another option when we, the seizures are coming from a very important part of the brain that has 
significant neurological functions, and we can try to use that to break up the seizure network without causing new deficits. The next slide, please. So who's an ideal candidate uh, for surgery to actually directly remove the seizure focus? Um, next, the initial thing is that we need to have focal seizures. So they need to arise from a very specific area. For example, this person has seizures arising from focal cortical dysplasia, sort of a, a birthmark on the brain. And so we were able to place the laser there and remove that tissue and that has made them seizure free. That has markedly changed their, you know, their outlook for life and what they consider being able to do in terms of school and future jobs and employment. The next, the second thing is they need to have intractable seizures. So as Dr. Kelly mentioned, we define intractable seizures, seizures that are refractory to drugs as having failed two medications. So it doesn't mean that once you've uh, failed two trials of medications that you'll necessarily go on to surgery, but it means that it definitely should be considered. And then third, um, we want to think about areas of the brain that may have very important neurologic functions and what removing that area would, you know, what new deficits that might cause. Next slide, please. So how do we decide between the laser ablation, which is also known as LIT, versus open resection. So there's several factors that we take into account. The laser ablation is shown in these body images. And so we place the probe into a precise area of the brain and then apply um, the laser to, again, remove that tissue. And we can do this very precisely in terms of the placement of the probe, but the uh, lesion that's made is about an inch in diameter. And we don't have much more control beyond that. And so, we can use the laser for things like this in the mesial temporal lobe, the, the inner middle part of the temporal lobe. It works fantastic for that. The patients could typically go home the next day. It's very little for them to recover from, you know, fairly similar to perhaps dental work. It's not much to go through in terms of a process compared to open surgery, which is much more to recover from. But for example, the image in the upper right shows an area of abnormality in brain, again called focal cortical dysplasia. This happened to be right in the middle of the motor strip. And so we could not use laser for this because the, with direct open resection, we were able to much more precisely remove that area. We were able to stop the seizures without causing significant new persistent neurological deficits. Uh, next slide, please. So we do have many additional options for people who have multiple seizure foci or seizures coming from both sides. Um, there's a, especially our kids with things like tuberous sclerosis, there are a lot of options for surgery. We also have options for those who were not able to tell which side the seizures are coming from and seizures that are coming from, again, the eloquent cortex, such as the speech areas. The next slide. So one of those options is called vagal nerve stimulation or VNS. And um, basically the generator is placed near the collarbone, similar to where a pacemaker generator is placed. And then the little electrode is threaded up to the vagus nerve in the neck. And the signal goes, travels up the nerve, basically as a conduit up to the brain. And a, the signal diffuses over the brain and breaks up any little seizures that may be forming. The generator has to be replaced every three to seven years as the energy runs down, and that is a simple outpatient procedure. For children, we find that approximately 60% have a lot better control of their seizures. For 30%, we don't notice that much difference than the medication cocktail that they're already on and only about 10% really have a home run. But for those particular patients, it can be, a very, again, a very significant improvement in their quality of life. There are some rare side effects. Those typically affect adults much more than they do the kids. The kids tend to tolerate the VNS extremely well. And then the next slide, the responsive neurostimulation, or RNS, is a newer technology. It's only been used in kids for the past few years, so it's harder to predict how much help it will have give the various um, populations of kids with different types of seizures. It does work very effectively 
for some children. Um, and basically the device can detect when the seizures are starting and then provide the stimulus to the brain at that time. It is more sophisticated. And again, we are just working out uh, which children most likely are, will benefit from this. So that's our slides and presentation, and we'll be happy to take questions now. All right, great. It looks like we've got the first question. Um, the first question is, if a child has focal seizures, but one generalized, would you describe that as focal epilepsy or generalized epilepsy as a diagnosis or both? So often, children who have focal seizures have what's called secondarily generalized seizures. So focal seizures start in one part of the brain, but then they can spread to the whole brain, leading to a generalized seizures. So a uh, generalized seizure. So in most cases, that would still be a focal epilepsy. There are a few rare types um, when some people do have both truly focal and generalized epilepsies, but that's much less common than having a focal seizure that secondarily generalizes. Um, the next question says, what are the implications of abnormal EEG, meaning spikes or sharp waves, if they aren't alongside seizures? I'm told it doesn't mean anything besides increased likelihood of seizure, but since it's considered abnormal, do they really not harm anything? Um, it's a good question, and it's a little bit of a complicated answer. So, um, so we, what those are called are interictal discharges. So those are spikes or sharp waves that we see between the seizures. They do um, indicate an increased likelihood of seizure. Um, and most of the time they don't cause a problem. However, there are some seizure syndromes, um, specifically something called ESES or electrical status epilepticus of sleep, when there's a lot of seizure activity overnight during sleep, and that can actually interfere with sleep. It can interfere with learning. Uh, so in most cases, the sharp waves are just indicating that someone has a seizure disorder, but every once in a while, it can mean a little bit more than that. Next question, if medications are controlling seizures fairly well for a child, is there a chance that this would change in the future and meds won't control them any longer? If so, is there data on the percent chance of this happening? Um, so there is something called a honeymoon period for medication. Um, so there are some people who will be on a medicine either for a short period of time or even years, and then suddenly the medicine stops working. And that's unfortunately something that we don't really understand yet as to why that happens to some people and not to others. Um, and so that's something we definitely need to learn more about, but it can definitely happen. Um, I don't think I, I know of a percentage um, chance of that happening. And the next question is, do certain types of seizures do better with surgery than others? Um, yes, um, so there are some seizures, there are some type of, types of seizures that are not um, amenable to surgery. So for example, a generalized seizure where it occurs in the whole brain all at once, um, would not be a type of seizure uh, that you could have surgery for because there's not one area of the brain. Um, however, if there's one area of the brain where the seizures are coming from, and especially if we can see something on the MRI that gives us an indication that there's something there irritating the brain, then those would be the best, um, the best people who would be candidates for surgery. Um, Dr. Robinson, did you want to add anything to that one? No, I think it's, that's why it's very important to have the combination of a high quality MRI with a lot of detail so we could see those perhaps tiny lesions. They're not um, caught sometimes on the sort of the quicker scans that may require sedation for a kid. And then um, combining that information with the video EEG monitoring. Great. And then the next question is for Dr. Robinson. Can the surgeon leave scar tissue, which can go on to cause more problems in the future? So we can. Um, that happens rarely, but it can happen. Um, usually, for example, those examples I showed where there's the focal cortical dysplasia, um, when we go in and remove that tissue, it's unlikely to cause uh, scar tissue that will cause additional seizures. Um, there can be a wider network of tissue that's prone to seizures than what we can see on the MRI, and so occasionally that does happen. Um, so that it's rare that the scar tissue causes you know, recurrent seizures, but it's not uncommon. The, um, our goal, obviously, is to achieve complete seizure control, but there are some of our kids that do initially achieve seizure control, and then after a few years, their seizures will come back. There is a lot of emerging evidence that even, you know, going back a second time and trying again can be very effective for patients. 
very similar if you think about it for cancer. Um, we think about it as obviously trying to cure the first time up, but if the seizures do come back, it's definitely worthwhile to consider additional surgery or other options um, to get better control. The next question says, if one child has epilepsy, for example, JME, do you recommend any testing for siblings or do you recommend a wait and see approach to see if they develop it at puberty? So the epilepsy syndromes that are genetic um, do have a wide range of who um, ends up getting seizures and who doesn't. And certain other epilepsy syndromes like benign Rolandic epilepsy or benign epilepsy with central temporal spikes um, is also genetic, but some kids will have seizures, some kids will have migraines, some won't have anything. And so we don't recommend testing unless there are symptoms. Um, and part of the reason for this is that there's about 2% of the population who will have spikes on their EEG and never have a seizure. So you don't want to treat someone just because there is a possibility based on an EEG because they may never have seizures and might not actually need to be treated. Uh, next question says, my child was diagnosed with benign Rolandic epilepsy as a child, which we thought he outgrew. My child had a seizure two weeks ago. Could it still be benign Rolandic epilepsy, though he is now a young adult? Um, so you're right, most um, people grow out of benign Rolandic epilepsy, um, but not everyone, and some people can go on to have other seizure types afterwards. So we would need to um, get an EEG at this point and hear about the seizures to make a diagnosis as to what is going on right now. Um, next question is, are there any research studies going on with children who have mild seizures to learn more about it? Uh, there's lots of research going on with all seizure types um, at this point. And um, so it just depends on the seizure type, the, um, whether or not they fall into a certain uh, study or not. Um, next question, do you recommend periodic EEG for monitoring um, even if the seizures are controlled by medication? So uh, this is a bit of a style um, question. Uh, different epileptologists, um, different neurologists will treat this a little bit differently. Um, I tend to get an EEG when I have a question that I'm going to answer. So that question could be if the patient has been seizure free for two years, is it time to come off medicine? Or the question could be seizures have changed a little bit. Do we need to see if something different's going on? Um, or medicine's not working anymore, do we need to answer why? And those are the reasons that I would do an EEG. Uh, some people do a little bit more monitoring than that. Is it okay to have abnormal EEG but no visible seizures? Should the goal be to get a clear EEG? So as I mentioned um, earlier, there, are, there is about 2% of the population who will have uh, seizure discharges on their EEG and never have a seizure. There is also some seizure types, specifically benign Rolandic epilepsy, where the seizure discharges may not go away, even if the seizures go away. So we do need to think about that. But there is other times, specifically with absence seizures, when you can have seizure discharges that could affect your awareness, you might not be aware of it. Um, and that becomes particularly important around driving. And so you wanna make sure that there's not lot, runs of seizure activity that could be interfering with driving. And so it really varies based on the seizure type and, um, uh, and how the person is being treated and what their EEG looks like. Um, is Lamictal a good choice for spikes? The child is three with initial diagnosis of infantile spasms and bleed at birth. So Lamictal is a good medicine for both generalized and focal seizures. Um, and so it really depends on, um, on what else is going on and uh, whether or not they respond to that medicine, um, but it can used, be used for a variety of different seizure types. Is the RNS similar to the VNS in the sense uh, that it is a generator under the skin and it's wired directly to the brain? Dr. Robinson, you wanna take that one? Yeah, so the RNS is similar in that there is a generator. The main difference is that with the VNS, the electrode is going to the neck and causing sort of a diffuse discharge or stimulation across the brain. Whereas in the RNS, there are electrodes that are specifically placed to deliver the stimulation in a certain place. Um, and so they're a little different in terms of where the stimulation is delivered to. The next question is, what brain MRI do you recommend? And this really depends on where the seizures are coming from. And so this is when we use that clinical history and the EEG that I discussed um, to think about where the seizures are most likely to be coming from and then look at that specific area of the brain more closely. There is there does tend to be a standard seizure protocol MRI, which looks a little bit more at the temporal lobe and the me what we call the mesial temporal structures, like the hippocampus and the amygdala, um, which is more where more seizures come from in the adult population. Um, but if there's other areas where it seems like the seizures are coming from, then we focus the MRI there. 
what does it mean by seizure free? Is it a month, a year, six years? Can it come back at any time? This is a, a somewhat difficult question to answer. So when we say someone can try to come off medicine, the seizure free period that we usually use is two years. Um, but if someone's off medicine and seizure free, the question is when do they no longer have a diagnosis of epilepsy? This is a, a bit debated. I'd say the people say between five and 10 years is where we what we call terminal remission, meaning the person no longer has epilepsy. Um, unfortunately, we can never say it's never gonna come back. Where can the public find out about information about studies on epilepsy in the DMV? Oh, so there are um, a number of studies out there looking at driving. Um, uh, I think, you know, I don't know where they're available um, in terms of um, just being able to look them up. I suppose if you went to the MVA or the DMV, you might be able to, um, I know one of the epileptologists in our institution, Dr. Gregory Kraus, has done a lot of studies um, in that area. So you might be able to look up his studies, but that might be something we can provide at a later time. Um, do you have any recommended resources where parents can learn more about the brain? Um, so the Epilepsy Foundation website is actually really good. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, they have a lot of information about all sorts of things. And I think that would be um, a great place to start. Um, also, our group is in the process of writing a book um, that's going to be coming out uh, hopefully in the next year or two um, that will have a lot of great information for parents about epilepsy in children as well. Um, what does a person feel during a WADA test and what is recovery like? Um, so uh, a WADA test, um, for, for those who don't know, is when we put half the brain to sleep to see if memory and language um, is still okay when the part of the brain that we might take out during surgery is um, put to sleep and not working properly. And so it is a little weird, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, um, I have not personally had a water, so it's hard for me to say exactly what they feel, um, but I, I know that people do say it's strange, they feel a little you know, disoriented, but, the, but there's lots of people around you all the time directing you back to answering questions and supporting you through the test. Um, and you recover very quickly. It's a very short acting medicine that's used. Um, should genetic testing be done just to mark it off the to-do list? And what is the basic purpose behind it? Um, so we do a lot more genetic testing now than we used to. Uh, genetic testing is generally recommended if someone has intractable epilepsy, meaning they've tried two medicines to high doses and it hasn't helped. Um, or if there's something, some other feature about their clinical picture, meaning do they have developmental delays? Do they also have autism? Um, uh, is there something else about what we see that might lead us to think that there's a genetic diagnosis? But in general, if someone has epilepsy that's easily treated, we don't do genetic testing. Um, is there such a thing as a wireless EEG? And do spikes interfere with cognitive development? Um, two questions. Okay, so the, um, there is a wireless EEG. Um, we actually do have it now in our epilepsy monitoring unit and they're just working out the details with IT as to how to get it going. Um, so that is a possibility. And that would be really nice for our epilepsy monitoring unit because then kids can move around and play much more easily. Um, and do spikes interfere with cognitive development is a complicated question. Um, so if there are a lot of spikes, and I had mentioned electrical status epilepticus of sleep before, so if there's lots of, sleeps, or lots of spikes during sleep, that can sometimes affect cognitive development. But it's not 100%, and not everyone who has spikes um, during sleep or at other times have, has an effect. So it's really important to talk with your doctor, look at the EEG. We do a lot of what we call neuropsychologic testing to see if there's um, a problem uh, that may be affected by spikes and then address it. Can teething pain cause relapse? Uh, so um, any type of stress on the body could theoretically lower the seizure threshold. Um, we, when we think about treating seizures, uh, we want you to be able to go about your normal life um, and not have to think about the seizures if you have some stress because stress is just part of life. So if teething pain is causing seizures, then most likely the dose of medicine that you're on is not quite enough and you might need a, a little bit of a change. What safety measures should I take at home to keep my child safe during a seizure? So um, what you always wanna do is move everything away from the child that could injure them, turn them on their side, don't put anything in their mouth. There are some old wives tales out there that, um, you sh uh, that someone could swallow their tongue, but it's not actually true. And putting something in the mouth that someone could choke on during a seizure is actually uh, much more dangerous. Um, and then if a child ever has a seizure that um, lasts longer than five minutes, then you definitely wanna call 911 or use the rescue medicine that you may have been provided by your um, neurologist. Does my child need to wear a medical alert bracelet? 
So I think um, that's not a bad idea, especially as children get older and are doing more things independently. There are a lot of actually cool uh, medical ID bracelets out there now. They're not all those uh, metal ones that you, that you think about. Um, and so, um, so you can get one that doesn't look at all like an ID bracelet, but an EMT or a paramedic would know to look for it if they were to, um, to be found unconscious somewhere um, and were getting medical treatment. Will surgery uh, for epilepsy impact my child's short-term memory? You wanna take the, the epilepsy or the surgery so, question? So it's, there's a potential there for some children and we have ways that we take a look at that. As Dr. Kelly mentioned, we do neuropsychological testing and that can help us identify the memory areas for kids because their brain is growing and developing and many of them have the whatever process their lesion in place while they're growing up as babies and toddlers, they may move their memory to another area. And so it's less common than uh, that it will be a problem than it is in adults where sort of the memory has already formed and then they tend to acquire their epilepsy later in life. So um, it is potentially a problem, but in general, we're able to know about it and weigh out those risks. If you have continued seizures from an area that controls memory, you're also likely to lose memory. So it's, a, it's one of those things where we balance the risks and benefits. And the next question is, what is recovery like for kids after surgery? So it depends, again, after or what type of surgery it is. For many of our kids, for example, if they undergo placement of a vagal nerve stimulator, we watch them overnight to make sure they can continue to take their medications and that they're comfortable. Uh, very similarly for the kids that undergo laser ablation, they stay overnight um, then in the ICU so they can be watched a little closer, but often, again, tend to go home the next day. For the patients who undergo open surgery, um, it can be a little more to recover from, and sometimes they're here for a few days. And very rarely, if they have new problems after the surgery, many of the times we predict that, because again, we're weighing off the risks and benefits of persistent seizures in important areas of the brain, they may need to even go to rehab. For example, the kids that undergo a version of disconnection or hemispherectomy often need to go to rehab uh, to recover sort of and optimize their physical movements as they're getting better. And can you elaborate more on the treatment? You mentioned the device you talked about. So the two devices are vagal nerve stimulator and responsive neurostimulation. So for the vagal nerve stimulator, that has been around for a couple decades now, and we have a little bit more experience with it. The kids tolerate it very well. Overall, it's a reasonably safe procedure, as if you've already failed two or three medications, it's much more likely to be effective than trying a new medication. But if you are a candidate for intracranial surgery, for example, um, you have a focal onset area as well as a lesion that matches up with that, it's much more effective to try to deal with that lesion directly than to use the vagal nerve stimulator. The vagal nerve stimulator is well tolerated. Um, and again, the generator replacement is fairly straightforward. The RNS is a much newer device. It's been well studied in adults and it's just moving over to kids. It's primarily only available for um, our older kids, maybe you know, eight or 10 and older and it requires localization of the seizure focus to some degree. And again, we're just learning about which kids benefit most from it. How much hair is shaved off for surgery? So it depends. Um, we do our very best to preserve the hair. So uh, usually the, the girls have a little bit longer hair and we can braid it out of the way and really only shave maybe you know, an area about um, like a generous half inch wide strip. Um, many of the boys tend to care less, but we still like to uh, give them the best haircut we can. We do our best work on the inside and not necessarily with the hairstyling, um, but I realize that's a, a significant concern for many of our kids, um, but it really is not that bad. We don't have to shave the whole head. 
Next question is, do seizure medications affect normal growth and development? And they shouldn't. Um, the one caveat not talking about medicine is the ketogenic diet. So ketogenic diet can cause um, some delay in growth. And so it's very important that if you're on that or a version of a diet that you're following with a dietitian and with a neurologist who can keep track of your growth, let you know if any supplements are needed, make sure you're getting enough protein um, and that you're growing well. And then the question is, are rescue medications uh, recommended for all types of seizures, like infantile spasms, or does it only work for certain types of seizures? So typically rescue medications are provided when, uh, when seizures go on for a long period of time, which is not usually what happens with infantile spasms. So if a seizure lasts longer than five minutes, that's usually when I recommend giving seizure medicine. I mean, sorry, rescue medicine. Um, there are some caveats to that. There are some people who always have really long seizures, and so you're gonna give them seizure medicine sooner. Um, and also if someone has multiple seizures in a row without coming back to themselves, that could be a time to give rescue medicine also. Typically it's not given for infantile spasms though. Is it common to get a second opinion? Should you expect a surgeon to be upfront if they are not the right person to perform surgery? Yeah, so it's very common for people to uh, get second opinions. And so, um, you know, sometimes we have to do emergent surgery as neurosurgeons, for example, if you're in a, an accident or something. And so usually people don't get second opinions for that. But for epilepsy surgery, most of the time people go through sort of an extended period of evaluation, usually over at least a few months. And so there is time to, um, you know, consider different options. It really depends on many different factors. The um, most children's hospitals offer epilepsy surgery is fairly common now. And so it's something to think about. You know, when I counsel families, I, we talk about that the, the continued burden of persistent seizures. And so if a child is having a lot of seizures, the overall impact to them may be you know, significant over time. It's a very different feeling as a parent to think about sort of putting your child up for surgery, as opposed to if I come to you after, you, you know, if they've unfortunately been in a, a significant accident or something and I say, oh, I need to go fix this skull fracture, or take out this blood clot, you're like, go get it done. But it actually, when you think about the long-term consequences, persistent seizures can be very problematic and it's really important to think about proceeding. And from my perspective, whatever a family needs to do to get to that point of proceeding with surgery, I'm completely happy with them doing. Um, it, it's very common for neurosurgeons that if a procedure is not something we do all the time, then we are you know, upfront about that. So um, that's not, that's for not only for epilepsy surgery, for all the other surgeries that we do. Yeah, and I completely agree. It's always okay to get a second opinion. And I, I think it's often important to kind of hear what other people have to say. And you should never feel like you're going to offend your doctor or something mm -hmm. if you go and get a second opinion. Um, we don't mind that at all. That's great. Um, the next question is, how soon after surgery will you know if it worked? So officially for intracranial surgery, where we're trying to cure the seizures, the sort of gold standard um, is using two years. Um, so if you're two years seizure free, then you're considered a seizure free outcome. There's variations on that. Many of the kids are seizure free for a period and then the seizures can recur um, even after the two years. So again, you kind of think about it like the cancer curves. Obviously we want everybody to be cured and stay cured, um, but depending on what caused the seizures and the various options. It's sometimes a, uh, a staged approach where we're weighing out the risks and benefits for each option and what we need to do for that individual child. Next question is, if there is a history of seizures for a few years, but testing looks normal, how can I convince a neurologist to perform additional testing? Um, so, I mean, this might be where your second opinion question comes in. Um, so if you feel like you're not getting the workup that, um, that you need, then, you know, you can always ask someone else. Um, there, is, uh, there are a number of people who have seizures who don't ever have an abnormality on their EEG unless you capture um, 
unless you capture an, a seizure. And so that's where our epilepsy monitoring unit comes in. Often we'll bring kids into the hospital, put an EEG on for a number of days, and really catch some of these spells to determine whether or not they're seizures. And so that's um, something else that, that could be looked at. Um, also, many kids who have seizures have normal MRIs, normal PET scans, normal other um, evaluations. So it's not unusual to see that when someone has seizures. Um, next question is, what should we be expecting? Oh, what, sorry, what should be expected during a second opinion? Will the doctor perform uh, his or her own evaluation, get blood work, et cetera? Um, so uh, it really depends on what's been done in the past um, and what they think um, are other options for treatment or evaluation based on everything that we hear during the appointment. Um, sometimes I feel like everything's been done exactly how I would have done it in the past. Sometimes I feel like there are other testing um, that would be helpful in diagnosis, or sometimes I think there's other treatments that would be helpful. And so I, I discuss all of that with the family. And then sometimes um, the families will do that uh, with me afterwards, and sometimes the families will take that information back to their other uh, neurologists and discuss moving ahead with those recommendations. And it's very similar for surgery. One thing is that the it does seem like that when you're at the option of considering intracranial surgery, it, some places may repeat the scalp EEG video monitoring episode before they would uh, go ahead with the intracranial EEG. So that is something that you want to think about. You may not want to do two or three episodes of that. The next question, is it ever okay to leave my child alone? Um, Yes, so, so kids with seizures, um, unfortunately seizures are unpredictable and you don't know um, necessarily when they're going to happen, but we want kids to live as normal lives as they can. And they're you know, otherwise normal children who should go to school, do everything they normally do and we want them to live, up, uh, live and do everything they want and as an adult as well. Um, but it is um, nerve wracking for sure to think about that you don't know if they're gonna have a seizure. And that's why um, different devices and things are being developed, specifically the FDA, the FDA approved um, watch, which is the Embrace watch at this point, can be helpful, especially overnight, um, because then you can um, be alerted if the child has um, movements that are suspicious of seizure activity, and um, or some people will just put baby monitors in their room um, to kind of give them an extra peace of mind. But in general, um, we do recommend trying to let the kids live, live a normal life as much as possible. If side effects persist after trying multiple medications, what are our options? Should we expect our doctor to keep trying to find something? Uh, yes, yeah, so if seizures are, are not controlled um, and the medicines that you've tried so far have side effects, um, then as I mentioned, there's over 30 different types of medicines. So there's, there may be other options that you haven't tried and you can look at those. Um, sometimes, depending on the side effects, there may be vitamins um, or other supplements that can counteract side effects. And so you may be able to use a medicine just with um, a vitamin supplement. And then there's other options such as dietary therapy that could be tried um, if medicine uh, is not working out. And what happens if my child misses one or more doses? So for most uh, people, um, for most medicines, if you miss one dose, it's not gonna be a huge deal. No one can remember to take their medicine all the time. Um, so missing one dose, uh, if you're more than, I always say if you're more than halfway to the next dose, just skip it and take the next one. If you're less than halfway, you can take it um, again and then just move on and continue to take your medicine as usual. Uh, if you miss more than one dose though, the levels can drop and that can lead to seizures. Uh, can you repeat the name of the FDA watch? So that was the Embrace watch, E-M-B-R-A-C-E, um, by Empatica is the company. What COVID safety measures are in place? Um, so uh, um, I guess I can answer that in terms of the hospital um, and our epilepsy monitoring unit, as well as EEG. So, um, so everyone is screened when they come into the hospital. Anyone who's admitted to the hospital is tested for COVID. Um, everyone has to wear masks and all the providers um, need to wear masks and face shields when seeing patients. Um, and so uh, it's been, been very safe to be in the hospital. Um, I, I have to say I feel safer going to the hospital than I do going to the grocery store. I think uh, people are following the rules much better and, um, and we haven't had uh, any problems with transmission um, in staff or anything like that. And I would agree. We also have um, all the procedures worked out for surgery. So all, as Dr. Kelly mentioned, all of our patients coming in for surgery will be tested ahead of time if it's a scheduled surgery. If we have emergent surgery, we um, have access to some rapid tests that help us keep everyone safe. And so, um, as she said, I feel much more comfortable being here at work. The only place that's probably safer is just being at home. So it's, it is very safe 
to be in and we don't want anyone to hesitate to come in if they need to. Can my child take antibiotics or other medicines? How about acetaminophen, vitamins, herbal remedies? So most medicines can be taken with seizure medicines. There's a few that can interact, um, like the ones I mentioned in the talk. Um, so if there's a question, there are a couple antibiotics that can change the metabolism of medicine. The seizure medicines can change the metabolism of a couple of medicines like the oral contraceptives. So you do just wanna run everything by your doctor before you start taking something new. And the same is true with vitamins and herbal remedies. There are some herbal remedies that can affect the metabolism of medicine or vice versa. There are also some herbal remedies that can lower seizure threshold. And so you definitely wanna discuss that with your neurologist and let them know that anything that you're taking. Are there any effective devices that are good at detecting seizures in infants while they sleep? Um, so so the, the best device that's out there right now, which is not for infants, is the Embrace Watch that I mentioned, um, which is good for detecting seizures that have convulsive movements. Um, we don't have uh, good seizure detection for much younger kids at this point. Um, there's a lot of work and a lot of actually competitions that are going on to create the best device. Um, and so the, we're still looking into that. What is a stay like in the epilepsy monitoring unit? So the epilepsy monitoring unit um, is where we bring kids for a few reasons. So um, one of the reason may to be to um, figure out what spells are happening and if they're seizures or not. We may also bring kids in to quickly switch their medicine, or we might bring them in to see if they're a seizure surgery candidate. And if that's the case, we wanna capture multiple seizures to see if they're coming from one place and, um, and can have surgery. And so when kids come in uh, to our unit, it's on uh, Bloomberg 10 South, which is our children's center. And um, the child life specialist usually brings them in um, and they get uh, EEG put on their head. Um, and then they have to stay within the room where they are um, while they're in the hospital. An adult has to stay with them. They do often need an IV uh, for rescue medicine if needed. And then while there, we monitor for seizures and events. Sometimes we change medicine. Sometimes we do things to, kind of tr to try to trigger seizures such as heavy breathing, hyperventilation, flashing lights, things like that. Um, and you're monitored 24 seven by the EEG techs who are always watching both the EEG and the video to make sure that you're safe and monitor uh, whether or not there's seizures. And then each day you talk with the doctors to discuss what's happened, what we see on your EEG and decide um, what the next best step for treatment is. Um, Dr. Robinson, did you wanna talk at all about intracranial monitoring there? Um, it's fairly similar um, in terms of you would just go to surgery beforehand and then go up to the epilepsy monitoring unit, but you basically are hooked up the same way and, and hanging out. Um, again, you know, staying in the room, having somebody with you, and we just wait and watch for the seizures and collect the information. Um, and then there's one last question. Um, are, the, um, are there medicines that should be spaced apart from other medicines or can they all be taken at the same time? Uh, for the most part, seizure medicines can all be taken at the same time. They don't really interact with each other because you take them too closely to each other. Um, the, the one uh, that we do need to think about um, in relation to food is actually the newest one, Epidiolex or CBD. Um, it can be affected by fat. So you would need to either always take it with food or not take it with food so that it doesn't get metabolized differently. Um, but most of them can be taken whenever. There are some where if it causes some belly upset, you might want to take it with food um, so you don't have that side effect. I think that's all we have time for today. So thank you so much for all of your wonderful questions. And thanks for joining us.